Well, welcome to another episode of Down the Middle. It's great to be with you here today. Uh, I would like to say that this is part of Valuetainment Economics, but it's a misnomer given who our guest is today. Vikram Mancharamani is with us. Uh, he, he's almost impossible to introduce because that would take the whole hour. Uh, suffice it to say, uh, he's coming to us uh, from a much colder area than we are up, up on the East Coast. He's a lecturer at Harvard, uh, which has absolutely nothing to do with his, with his background in education. Um, <laughs> he has just written a great book, Think for Yourself. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna throw something out there. I think in a world of social media, if there's one thing that 2020 has taught us more than anything else, because so many Americans and people around the world have been brainwashed, it is that it is critical to think for yourself. So I highly recommend grabbing a copy. Um, and with that, you know, I have one overarching burning question to start with. And that is, do you have multiple personality disorder? Uh, I mean, you, you, you have a degree in everything that we could put economics, finance, um, and yet you're not a lecturer in economics or finance or even policy. You're tucked into the engineering department. How did that happen? And no. just give us a, just a quick rundown. Again, we don't have the whole time to, just to introduce sure. you. We're actually going to have to get on to your predictions at some point. But how? tell us the circuitous route that landed you where you are. Yeah, thanks, Danielle. First of all, thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be with you. Um, and, you know, it's a really interesting story that you're starting with here, which is uh, it really gets to the heart of how I think I'm a little bit different than other people and my way of thinking, which is I think of myself as a generalist. And as a generalist, I try to employ skills and insights from multiple disciplines. And as such, all of my undergraduate training, all of my graduate training, all of my own personal research crosses silos. And uh, you know, to get to, to the answer uh, to your question, I ultimately was being recruited to teach at Harvard. I was teaching at Yale at the time, and they were looking for a home for me. And they said, well, look, you've written a book on finance, maybe economics. Well, the economics department said, you don't have a PhD in economics. Um, my PhD, by the way, is in the field of innovation and entrepreneurship from MIT. Uh, I studied with the, with the economics curriculum uh, at MIT, which is pretty legit in the grand scheme of things. But uh, in any case, um, so the government department wouldn't take me because I don't have a PhD in political science. The sociology department wouldn't take me because I don't have a PhD in sociology. The policy school said you don't have a PhD in policy. And ultimately, I found my way over to the, uh, the, the School of Engineering at Harvard, and they said, wow, you sort of think like a dot connector. You're sort of a systems thinker. Uh, we had a great conversation. They said, we'd love to have you. And on the way out the door, before they formalized the offer, they said, oh, by the way, uh, Vikram, where did you get your PhD from? And I said, well, you know, I, I studied over at MIT. And they were like, oh, well, that's fine. That's legit. Um, and they never really asked what I studied, but you know, MIT got the reputation, so it was fine. <laughs> That's that that is that is truly truly fabulous. Um, so uh, bring us around to what what caused you throughout your career to see as much of the world as you as you saw. Was is that part of this multidisciplinary approach you take? Uh, and wh why are you waiting on Antarctica? Yeah, <laughs> so uh, it's interesting, Daniel. I think you're hinting at the fact that I have, in fact, traveled a fair amount in my life, but it is actually very consistent with the idea that every single perspective is limited, every single perspective is biased, and every single perspective is incomplete. As a result, I've always felt, if you think probabilistically, the more the merrier. More perspectives, better insight. And that comes geographically as well. I mean, we all live in our little bubbles, whether it's the economics profession bubble, whether it's the US uh, you know, intellectual bubble, whether it's an American bubble, whether it's a Western hemisphere bubble, or whether it's a you know, sort of other bubble. But I have found it very valuable 
to go and firsthand experience those different perspectives. Uh, and whether that's all over the African continent or in, you know, at, on a plantation in Southeast Asia, I've made it there to look and see so that I can adopt different perspectives myself. Uh, I think that's really critical. So before we jump into your predictions, which, um, which I'm fascinated by, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in a place yet where I feel like I can do predictions per se. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that I focus on monetary policy, sure. finance, and economics. These things can change. If, if the stock market moves by 5%, then all of a sudden they're, you know, they, they, they meet around the oval table in the Eccles building and all policy changes. So yeah. I'm a kind of a real-time person. But I do want to ask you a question about your travels and your education and whether you were able to witness globalization. Yeah. Like yeah. firsthand. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a very interesting question. The answer is yes. I mean, look, I have been going to India for family reasons since the mid 1970s. Uh, I mean, you, you you very visibly saw it there. Uh, I mean, I watched how uh, foreign influences made their way there. Uh, my first trip to China was in 1992, 90, excuse me, 93. Um, and, you know, I got a sense as to what was happening there then, and I've obviously been back since. Uh, and so I've watched globalization. My first international trip, not family oriented, was I was I was really blessed and, and lucky to, to go to a, a private school on a scholarship. Um, and one of my history teachers in high school decided in 1989, let's go check out Czechoslovakia. Uh, which it was called back then. Uh, and so we went to Prague um, and I went to Prague in high school and right as the Soviet, by the way, there were no McDonald's, there were no sort of Western influences. And so I watched globalization transpire. Obviously going back to it 20, 30 years later, you see a different world. So the answer is yes, I have seen globalization in different aspects, different parts of the world. Um, you know, my first trip to China, the, you know, there was a McDonald's in Beijing. There was I don't even know if there were Starbucks in China at that time. Um, you didn't see a Kentucky Fried Chicken. You never saw any of these Western brands. So globalization has happened in that way, of course, and it's very visible today. Um, so let's let's jump into your first prediction because it's probably yep. the subject that I write the most about. Uh, the first time, and it and it also has to do with your global view because uh, I think inequality is something that used to be restricted. You would think of inequality as associated with a third world country um, or with a dictatorship, but, but inequality in and of itself has become, has gone global and not in a good way. In my view, I think it has a lot to do with central bankers all kind of doing the same way, uh, all kind of pushing the same policies out that widens the inequality divide, but you had your eye on inequality a very long time ago before it was such a buzzword. Sure. Yeah, no, it's interesting. It's a great topic, Danielle. I uh, I actually taught a class on economic inequality back, geez, this would have been years and years ago. I went and I taught it over in Singapore for the Yale NUS uh, college. This was a new residential college I set up over there. And I did it because I really wanted to be controversial and I wanted to show how inequality in a place that was deemed so perfect in, in so many people's eyes was actually rampant, just not as surfaced, if you will. Um, and I really do believe that inequality might in fact be the single largest challenge facing democratic capitalism, et cetera. And, and, and while many, uh, uh, many an individual will focus on globalization as a cause or as an accelerant of inequality pressures, I would suggest that technology has been equally uh, at, at fault here. Um, and it's not just a globalization driven phenomenon uh, because what we've fundamentally seen, and I'm glad we're asking this question, you're having this topic raised first, not at the end. Look, let me be honest. The return on capital has gone through the roof while the return to labor has been pinched. Mm -hmm. That results in an expanding inequality that's continuing and compounding. And by the way, we all see it with the difference that's happening right now because of COVID with the difference between Main Street and Wall Street, right? Mm -hmm. Indices hitting all time highs, unemployment still elevated. Go talk to any waitress, any person who works at a restaurant, bar or travel sector, a hotel employee, uh, an airline executive, they don't feel so good. Whereas Wall Street feels great. 
Um, mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's a big delta there. And I agree, central banks are a contributing factor. But the fact is, return on capital has gone through the roof while return on labor has been pinched. That is a recipe, by the way, for communism. In fact, the Communist Manifesto, they, they, they in fact say, workers of the world unite, overthrow those in control. The Marx Engels reader points to from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. By the way, that is a wealth redistribution tax. Mm -hmm. By the way, Senator uh, from Massachusetts who um, you know uh, works as a colleague at the law school uh, or worked, excuse me, um, Ms. Warren, she suggested this. I mean, this is actually all coming out of the inequality problem. Um, and so I think to help capitalism save itself from itself, it becomes really important to start installing better safety nets. We may in fact find it is prudent to have higher minimum wages uh, because ultimately you want your employees to be able to afford the very goods and services you as a company produce. That if you pinch labor too much, you're pinching the ultimate source of your demand. Um, and so, um, you know, I think we need to be more thoughtful about that. So, you know, you raise an issue of, you know, there's a difference between raising the minimum wage and universal basic income. Yeah. There's a yawning gap between the two. And yet, and yet here we sit at the precipice of mm -hmm. continuing on something that was introduced during the CARES Act, which is effectively paying people to not work. And if you want to look at the irony of it, uh, one of my one of my favorite examples in the world right now is that China is repairing, improving, or building thirty airports. So their fiscal stimulus puts people to work, and there's a return on that fiscal investment. And here we and, and that's a communist state. And here we are in the United States of America, talking about implementing effectively a socialist type of construct, universal basic income throwing money at people who don't necessarily need it, not, not target it, but very much a shotgun approach. Yeah. Yeah. Look, you're, you're, there's not much I can add here other than you're right. Uh, look, uh, fundamentally, this idea of supporting people in work to get a sort of a reasonable return on labor expended rather than the handout, which diminishes the incentive structures and all the good benefits that capitalism brings. Uh, let me put it, let me be clear. I am a free market capitalist. I love capital. Capitalism has helped bring more people out of poverty in the world than any other force I can point to. This is a genu genuinely good way to organize. However, it's not without its faults. And to protect itself from itself, there should be some constraints. One likes to hope there'd be self-constraints, right? You hear of companies, leading companies in America that are more long-term oriented that are saying, look, we're going to pay higher than normal minimum wages because we want our people to be able to go buy goods and services that we produce, you right. know, et cetera. So I think you're right. The, not your question, but relating to the idea of fiscal expenditures, particularly deficit-driven expenditures, debt by itself is never a problem. What you do with the debt, I think, is a problem and how you choose to allocate that borrowed money. If it's money that, look, if you and I go, if I go borrow some money from a bank and have this spectacular, you know, party and we just burn it all tonight, there's not much I'm left to show with. I have nothing to show for that endeavor tomorrow other than a good memory, maybe, maybe, <laughs> right? Whereas if I instead took all that money out and I bought myself a bunch of lemons and I put up a lemonade stand and I got a marketing plan and I designed this all natural, environmental, gluten-free lemonade, you know, there may be some demand. I could generate a return on that borrowed capital. And so what you do with borrowed capital actually matters. And I think to your point, handing it out for consumption is one use of capital that we might say, hey, hold on a sec. We're not clear that's the best use of deployment. Whereas investing borrowed capital that can generate a return in infrastructure and other ways is a universally positive thing, I would imagine. Um, yes. And if we had all the time in the world, we could talk about how Germany has produced the lowest youth unemployment rate in Europe and how and, and because it focuses on working with companies to yep. re constantly reskill even yep. existing employees anyways um, if there's one thing that we saw hit the boiling point uh, 
in 2020 into 2021 is the role that technology plays in surveilling us. Yeah. You know, Elon Musk comes out and you know he, he says, "Run to Signal," and of course the day traders run to some other stock and run it up from sixty cents to six bucks a share. But yeah. how how do we live in America and have a company like Facebook say the op the, the ability to opt out is going away on February the eighth? Prepare yourself. I mean, how in the world does that work? One of your predictions for 2021 is that this situation is hitting a break point. Explain yep. that. Yeah. So look, Danielle, I think, in fact, I highly recommend this book uh, by Shoshana Zuboff, who was the first uh, tenured business school professor at the Harvard Business School, first female uh, tenured business school professor, Shoshana Zuboff, wrote a book called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And I have to tell you, it is both ridiculously insightful and so deeply disturbing uh, at the same time. Um, and it is in fact these big tech companies that have decided to hoover up all the data that exists and connect it so that their ultimate objective is to manage us, uh, to, to, to extract away effectively your autonomy so that you may think that you're doing things for your own doing, but they may in fact be guiding you like the like a mouse proverbially through the maze to the cheese, so to say. So what do I mean by that? Well, turns out Google will be reading your email on a device and all the other things that you use for Gmail. Uh, so that's fine. Maybe Google can read your email. Maybe you say, I have nothing to hide. Uh, they have your Fitbit. So they know, by the way, your heart rate is moving at a certain rate when you're reading that email because they have timestamps on this stuff. And then, by the way, they know you walked into your house and the first thing you did was X because the Nest device that they own is there and checks the monitors, the temperature and movement in that room. And so they know your pattern of movement, et cetera. Now they also know that you checked your email that came from this person on an Android device. There's 2 billion of those. So they have a data of where you are for most of the time. Um, they know not just because most Android devices have not just location, they have barometric pressure gauges. They can tell not just that you're at the Starbucks on the corner of 14th and, and 3rd, that you're on the 13th floor of that building and there's a family law office up there. So it's, hey, you were communicating with people that you're not married to. You were at the Starbucks with that other person. Then you went up to the family law office. They now surmise that there's a high probability you're considering a divorce. Here's your ad, but do it yourself divorce kit. Um, it just a little too, look, I will here. In fact, this is great evidence right here on the video. I've moved to a dumb phone because I don't like the monitoring. And by the way, we haven't even gotten into the, the metadata problem, right? So it's not just, for instance, that you use your phone to tweet. It's that each tweet is tagged with, I don't know what the number is, 50, 70 pieces of metadata. Where were you before? What did you look at before? What was the email you read before? What did you do after? Which IP address was it? Which app were you on before? Uh, what might you've been reading, thinking about, et cetera, beforehand? You know, all of these things come into play with each and everything. And then they use big data and analytics to say, all right, this implies this about your behavior, your thinking, or what have you. Uh. So I think I, I think there's a there's a reasonable call to suggest we should restore our autonomy by pushing back against this. And I agree with you, it becomes hard for individuals to do so, which means it is a reasonable ground for regulatory intervention because uh, you know there's no other way to contain that perhaps. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm no big advocate for big government, but at some point, the company becomes bigger than the government. That's right. And, and that, right. that's problematic. So, you know, we have become, as Americans, very inward looking in 2020. There were so many things happening, whether you're talking about the pandemic or the presidential election or the backlash against China. Did we sort of miss something in India? What is your third, talk, yeah. talk through your third prediction because I yeah. think something rather large happened there in 2020. And where is this headed? Because when you look at demographics at last check, India's got more people than China and a better demographic composition of their population as well. 
Yeah, maybe, maybe. So I've had over the last few years, I've been doing these predictions, uh, these five-year rolling predictions since 2015. Um, and in years past, I said, India is going to be the world's fastest growing large economy. They're on fire. Their demographic profile looks fabulous. I then went further and I said, you know what? Actually, technology is coming forth, automated manufacturing, the Make in India campaign will in fact attract manufacturing, but they're not going to get jobs. And India is going to be the biggest disappointment there is in the world because actually this logic that economists of the world have used for so long, which is there's this demographic dividend, cheap labor is useful, is broken that that actually is upside down. We need to think of India as not having a demographic dividend or a demographic tailwind, but instead as a demographic headwind or a noose around its neck. Why do I mean, what do I mean by that? Well, lots of young people means you better produce lots of jobs. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about, you know, so it's a development strategy shift that needs to take place. Here's what I mean. China may have been the last large economy that took the farmer, to the factory, the production went from 10 bushels of wheat to a thousand iPads. And those gains were then shared a little bit back with that worker who went and became a consumer producing a consumer society, right? That industrialization based development strategy, I think is now broken, particularly on scale. And India needs a development strategy at scale. And so the illiterate unskilled Indian farm worker is now competing against a robot that doesn't complain, that works around the clock, that doesn't have religious holidays or protests, et cetera. And that when he makes a mistake, the engineer corrects it and he doesn't make the same mistake again, ever, right? And so I'm really nervous about the long-term prospects for the emergence of a large Indian middle class. I think it's a hope, you know, Tim Cook said China was great, India is the next China. I have to laugh at that. The average Indian the GDP per capita is somewhere in the 2000s, but the iPhones are costing what, a thousand bucks these days or almost? I mean, half of an annual salary of an average Indian and you think you're going to sell millions of these things? No. Will there be a market? Yes. Will it be a big market? Yes. Is it the next China? No. So that's number one. Now to the, to the more recent prediction I made, which was India becomes geopolitically important. I think this is really interesting. Uh, obviously, I think so. I'm biased. <laughs> but um, India had an armed conflict with China this this past year. We, we, a yeah. lot of people didn't pay attention to that. No. Um, you know, in the in the border areas where they have uh, disputes, there were guns fired and people died. This is between two nuclear armed powers. By the way, we might have remembered last year, India had similar conflicts with its other neighbor, Pakistan, which is also a nuclear armed power. Um, and so this is really an interesting part of the world. And I would argue potentially becoming as interesting as any other part of the world from a geopolitical and national strategy perspective. Um, and I think the US will come to conclude that India can be a countervailing force in that part of the world against uh, just China, right? I mean, sort of we can help have a influence in that region um, to combat the Chinese influence that's been growing. Um, and by the way, it can help also with the Pakistan relationship, but it has the potential to lead us very much into conflict with uh, India's traditional patron saint, which is Russia. Um, and so that creates some complications, but it's something to watch. Well, I'll be keeping it on my radar and I'm hoping for next year, uh, you can tell us all how that India can finally build out its infrastructure. I once tried to explain to somebody that the, the multiple of highways in China was so big, I needed an extra large screen on my calculator. And they're like, that's impossible. There's so many people there. And I'm like, no, there really is. There, yeah. there are no highways. Yeah. Relatively well, it's very funny. You bring up infrastructure in India, Daniel. I, uh, um, I have once on a panel I was giving in the Middle East, um, they asked me, oh, well, of course, the Make in India campaign is going to be fabulous. And it's going to change this story, right? They're going to have all these jobs and creation. I said, that's fine. You can make in India, but the infrastructure is such that you won't be able to get it out of India. Right. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Um, let's shift gears here to, uh, to a subject that's near and dear to me. Uh, I, I like to say that the biggest bubble that we have seen in financial markets is the confidence bubble in central banks. So 
is there a bridge too far? Will the Fed ask for inflation and oops, get it? Yep. Assume that they can impose yield curve control because nothing has fought them since the last time interest rates were going up in 1981. So they've got a 40 year track record at this point, or so they think. Is there a limit to central banks? And this is a question that I could have asked you yep. in 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Yeah, yeah. I think there is. Uh, I don't have any precision as to where that limit lies, <laughs> of right. course, Danielle, right. right? So, uh, what I would say is, I believe that the way you phrased it initially hits the nail on the head perfectly, which is confidence in central banking. And my interpretation of an asset such as gold is you can think of it as the reciprocal of that very confidence in central banking. And so if you think the confidence in central banking is likely to fall, well, then your denominator is going down, which implies the ratio should go up. And uh, it suggests to me that what I call non-printable currencies uh, have a very optimistic future. They have a nice tailwind behind them. And associated with the tailwind that might go with these non-printable currencies, such as Bitcoin and gold and precious, et cetera, um, is in fact a underlying losing of confidence in central banking. So those two are sides of the same coin, all right? I mean, loss of faith in central, loss of faith in central banking, as well as um, you know uh, the faith in the non-printable side, the non-politically manipulatable currencies. Is, is it feasible? Uh, and gosh, I mean, I can just my my Twitter feed just went poof. There's a mushroom cloud over it. Is it possible to distinguish between gold and Bitcoin because? the Bitcoin addicts will tell you that Bitcoin is going to take out gold. And yet in your one prediction, you put the two of them together. Yeah, there, there wasn't a lot of uh, precision between those two. I think they should both benefit. Um, you know, the argument that Bitcoin is in fact digital gold and in fact better and sort of infinitely divisible, easily carried, all this stuff that is in fact not the case with, I mean, look, if I need to run out of a country and I'm worried and I got to carry with me, I don't know, let's say a couple million bucks, I, I, am I going to literally fill up the backpack with bars and go? Right. That's one argument that, okay, well, I can just throw it on a device and go. I got it electronically. Um, the other argument is, well, gold will be so expensive that you might not need more than one backpack to bring the entire wealth with you, right? So there's a, there's like a that argument. That one's I'm on that side. Yeah, there's a flip side of the yeah. argument. Um, and you're talking your book. <laughs> My point is these guys, gold and, and Bitcoin, may think of themselves as competitors uh, and, uh, and, and possibly, uh, quote unquote, enemies. But I would tell you, they are massively in this. They're in the same boat. The tide has taken both of them. One may do better than the other. One may ultimately grab a bigger share. But there are devotees that will always have a concern about the cyber and the hacking risk and the digitalization risk that will want that tangible, physical, in-hand you know, thing that for 5,000 plus years has been deemed a currency because of its scarcity, because it doesn't break down, because it is divisible, because blah, 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 um, that I think there's a story for both. Okay. Very diplomatic. Very, very yeah, good. Trying uh, to be. <laughs> um, so um, just, I'm, I'm going in, in chronological order here. Fine. And, I, and I have to say, uh, I've never been one. I started off on Wall Street and I, it was a place where you could be a woman, a man, black, brown, yellow, white, in between. It really, it didn't matter what you were. It, it, the only thing that matters was what you produced. Yep. That was it. So it was yep. a great place to kind of neutralize all yep. aspects of diversity. Um, but you you see a you see a shift. You see yeah. a structural move. And don't get me wrong. I mean, women are by far smarter than men, so I get it. Uh, but why do you see this as being a turning point, if you will? Yeah, look, I think the diversity motion or movement, if you will, has has gone. Um, you know, has gotten escape velocity, if you will, and mm -hmm. that is uh, is likely to stay for some period of time. And really, what I'm suggesting in that next prediction is that 
uh, we get mandated diversity at the board level of corporations and that activist investor or, or shareholder services support groups uh, do that. This has happened elsewhere in the world. You know, the Scandinavian countries mandate certain gender distributions on their boards. Uh, we'll see some more uh, distributional requirements, if you will, from an ethnicity or, or sort of skin color perspective. Um, so I think that's all coming. Um, I don't think it's a particularly controversial statement to say it's coming. Uh, we feel the pressures now. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that. that I, I do see that coming. So, um, and I don't think it's a bad thing, by the way, Danielle, I don't think it's a bad thing because again, go back to where we started this conversation, more perspectives, better always. These are just different perspectives. I now, I, I, would, I, I just always assumed that, that people knew this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now where I, where I have issues, look, I am a minority. I have issues with this. When people reduce standards and use a, you know, label as a reason to put someone in a position where you pass over someone who is more qualified, mm -hmm. that I have issues with. Right. But I do think we have enough qualified women and enough qualified minorities that that shouldn't be a consideration. Absolutely. No, I'm, I'm with you. Um, so I, I've been saying for some time, don't get me wrong, there is a symbiotic relationship between China and the United States. China doesn't have enough food and we don't have enough technology. Yep. Uh, but there's this point of friction in between called Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And so walk us through your next prediction because this is enormous. I, I look at Huawei's got, Huawei's got thir a third of all telecommunications equipment on the planet is in the hands of one company. I mean, you could say that there is a tangible national security threat simply because of China's dominance in the technology sphere. But again, there's this thing in between. And the yeah. biggest semiconductor producer in the world happens to be right there in Taiwan. So walk us through where you see this headed. Yeah. So I've written extensively and talked extensively, Danielle, about the idea that this US-China rivalry is not just a trade conflict. It's not just a tech race. It's not just a space race. It's not just an arms race. It's not just a currency war. This is full spectrum, great power rivalry. Let's not call it anything else. That's what it is. Um, and so I think that's an important context to think about because when we get to this uh, thing that you indicate wisely is between us, uh, this little island, uh, Formosa or Taiwan, um, we have provided de facto security guarantees to protect them. Uh, we also have signed in the Shanghai communique that there is one China based in Beijing. Um, and so in theory, we don't recognize this entity that we're providing support to um, in theory, we're going to protect an entity that is a portion of another sovereign state. And the Chinese view this really uh, as, as quite insulting, right? It's that, uh, you know, I actually met with uh, some, some very senior Chinese political leaders uh, last year. And the analogy used was, well, wait, Vikram, how would you feel if we sold military equipment and arms to California? I said, well, actually, you don't understand. I'd be fine with that. But I said, he said, no, no, no. I mean, like if it was part of your country, I was like, yeah, I understand. I'm joking because the Californians think differently than the rest of us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but they view it as arming one of their states effectively to be independent and a foreign country supporting that, you know, especially given the context of the sort of foreign powers carving up China in, in you know, 1800s through the early 1900s. This is a problematic history. They believe the great rejuvenation of the Chinese uh, nation state has been coming together. They reclaimed uh, Macau. They've reclaimed Hong Kong. They're bringing back the, the sort of territory. And here's this one thorn that we, their rival in a great power sense, continues to support. I think it's, the, it's got the potential to be a flashpoint. Um, and I don't know what that flashpoint or how that flashpoint actually comes uh, into, into relief, so to say, but is it conceivable? I think the Chinese were trying very much to diplomatically turn the political tide domestically within Taiwan 
um, I shouldn't even use that word. That's that's an assumption to call it domestically within Taiwan um, to turn the tide. Japanese would, would prefer that you use the term domestically. Yes. <laughs> well, the idea being the Chinese were trying to get a local sentiment in favor of reintegration diplomatically, peacefully, etc. Uh, I think after their crackdowns on Hong Kong, the Taiwanese election went the other direction, and that resulted in a resetting of strategic thinking around how to reintegrate this wayward province back to the motherland. And America stands in the way. So I think it's a flashpoint. I think it's a real potential problem. It's something to watch closely. We'll see, uh, you know, this could be a real test of, of U.S. military resolve in the Asia Pacific. Well, the stakes are pretty high if you consider how you started answering the question with a clash of two superpowers. That's right. Um, okay, so uh, I, I need to know because, um, well, I, I was born the year after we landed a man on the moon, but uh, what good does getting back to the moon do us? I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm curious. And, I'm, and sure. now I'm putting on my ignorant hat. So, but just no. walk, walk me through why we need to go back to the moon. Yeah. So a handful of reasons, uh, Danielle. Number one, the engineering, science, and basic research support to go to the moon and build out a moon colony, perhaps even, I think can be inspiring, exciting, energizing, and um, enabling of a whole STEM revitalization in the education infrastructure. So I think there's some value there. Oh, that's that. Yeah. You you had me at you had me at revitalizing education. You can stop there. That's so amazing. Sorry, continue. But as a wayward point, so to say, on your way to Mars or further, I do believe that the moon can prove useful as a refueling or whatever a station you want to call it. So, you know, this is now longer range thinking. I th that's why I put in the prediction that they announced plans to build the colony, not that they built the colony by then in the next five years. Um, and so I think that's coming. It may enable us to use some really cool 3D printing technology uh, and build structures on the moon, et cetera. So there's some really interesting options there. Uh, further, there are materials on the moon. We know the moon has helium-3, which can be a fuel source for fusion. Um, we know the Chinese have gone there with the idea of maybe taking some of this stuff and bringing it back home. Um, okay, so there may be some physical commodity materials uh, logic to going to the moon as well. And so there's the scientific endeavor, there's the energizing and inspiring of educational endeavor, uh, there's the sort of future jumping point logic. And what I would say, as was the case with a lot of our military innovations through and the military research through the Cold War, there will be a lot of unintended benefits, right? Whether it's you know, in, in the Cold War, communication mechanisms generated something called the internet. Um, you know, th th we don't know what's going to come. We don't know what's going to come or how, but the odds are in favor that there will be spillover positive impacts. Um, now I know where to send all four of my children, who, by the way, have been forced since they were five years old to learn Mandarin. And they still don't quite, they're starting to understand. They're starting to get it as they age. Um, Start, it wasn't COVID as much as it was the trade war hmm. that started to rejigger the way we view the supply chain. Yeah. Now, I've been hearing rumblings from my friends uh, who are, are big China watchers that we might see a second Lunar New Year in a, in a row effectively canceled. Yeah. Because... The virus is not in Wuhan province. The virus, the virus is right outside Beijing. Yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, again, these, these, are, these are just things that I'm hearing. But I, I don't know that if, if you're Ford or if you're a major manufacturer and you've been dealing with input prices on a roller coaster, I cannot imagine another major disruption in the global supply chain. Uh, I mean, just but one example, 24% of all auto supplies come from China into the United States. People don't yeah. realize how how Inter it, it's not like flipping a switch and saying, we're just going to move everything to Mexico or Vietnam. It's, it's not that easy, but you see this causing an evolution in the way we, we approach inventories. 
Yeah. Yeah. So a couple of things I'll say there in terms of the dynamic, Danielle. First of all, the global supply chain logic that accompanied globalization was driven by a lowest cost, just in time logic. It was based on a handful of arbitrages, generally economic arbitrages, that took place over the last 40 years, right? So you went to where the labor was cheapest. By the way, that logic doesn't matter as much when you use technology. You went to where the taxes on value added were cheapest. By the way, in light of lower corporate taxes in America, that logic doesn't matter as much. You went to where energy supplies were consistent and you could have some reasonable structure on your cost side of things from an energy input. By the way, North America now has pretty stable, resilient, regular supplies of energy at reasonable costs. So that arbitrage went away. You went to where um, you know transportation costs didn't matter because there was just frictionless world. Well, that sort of, we had some more frictions put into play. So when you throw all of this into the mix, first it was the trade war. You say, okay, this little widget that went into my final product, sweet, I thought it was $6. Wait, Danielle, you're telling me now after this tariff, it's going to be $22? My business model just went out the window. I can't do that. All right. So, all right, let me move it out of there for that. Oh, wait, now you're telling me, hold on, that $6 widget, which I was willing to pay $20 for because I had to change my business model. Now you're telling me I can't even get it? What? Because it's lockdowns? Okay, that's not acceptable. Now you're rippling through my whole business. Uh, that doesn't work. Now you're telling me there's geostrategic reasons that my great power rival is going to potentially have access to my supply chain and the intellectual property and stuff that's produced there? I don't like the sound of that. Okay, now let's rip it out of there. Oh, by the way, then there's this ESG dynamic that says, oh, you want a smaller carbon footprint for your supply chain? Well, a long supply chain has more carbon being utilized than a shorter one. So, Okay, that's another pressure point. Anyway, you can add these up. There are multiple pressure points that make me believe the geography of manufacturing is shifting and it's going to move closer to end consumers. So producers and consumers, which were distanced in space and time, are going to move closer and they're going to move closer. And so the idea of just-in-time lowest cost supply chain logic is giving way to just-in-case resilient supply chain logic. Okay. And that means... Part of resilience is higher buffers, greater inventories to handle potential disruptions. And I think it's best captured with just in time, moving to just in case. I like that. I like that a lot. And it sounds like it's probably promising for Mexico's and Canada's economy yeah. as well. I mean, by, by extension. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a regionalization. It's not a ending of globalization. It's a shortening of supply chains. It's a regionalization logic, um, you know, because labor still matters. It's just not as important such that I'm willing to oversee or you know, take inordinate risks to take my supply chain halfway around the world uh, in the middle of a uh, yeah, well, pandemic, pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> all these other dynamics. Yeah. Um, so, so this next one, I wish we could spend the rest of the time on because it is something I've written on so extensively uh, and it's so important. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to bait you. Has passive investing ever truly been stress tested? Because people tell me all the time, Danielle, no, these bond no. ETFs didn't blow up. Look, look, we had a global pandemic hit and they're, they're swimmingly fine. They're fine. Passive is tried and tested. It's fine. Yep. So my prior book, uh, Boom Bustology, the final chapter of the revised edition was the passive investing bubble is the next big bubble to go. I don't think it's been tested. Uh, it's a good idea that's been taken too far. Um, and if you think about it, it's based on a belief very simply that prices are correct, that markets are efficient, that we should just take those prices and minimize our research and other expenditures, right? Be a price taker. However, what we found is as that market share of passive has grown, that that price taking logic has given way to price making. And in fact, flows will matter as much, if not more than fundamentals. And so when we have a huge tide of money coming in, it doesn't really matter what kind of boat you're in, you're rising. And when the money's going out, it doesn't matter what kind of boat you're in, you're sinking. And it's just as simple as that. Fundamentally, I could go further and say, this is, a, this is genuinely creating a risk to the price mechanism that allocation of capital uses as the fundamental guiding force. 
And so misallocated capital funded by this devout religious belief that passive is the right way to do things is a recipe that has produced, I think, a ticking time bomb that will go off. And I can't tell you what the catalyst to make it go off. I suggested in this piece that, well, maybe the retirement swings from inflows to outflows. Maybe that's one of the catalysts. There's multiple potential catalysts for uh, the passive investing bubble to, to, to get pricked, if you will. Um, the retirement uh, acceleration is one of them. Well, if you think about the news that we were not paying attention to in 2020 because everybody was focused on the CARES Act, there was this little itty bitty one line item that said mandatory distribution is is put on hold. So, I mean, you've clearly been speaking to somebody in the government because because that whole demographic impulse was effectively neutralized with a law. So temporarily, at some point that will that will give that can't hold forever. Right. Well, it's not, at some point, it's not whether it's mandatory or not. At some point, I mean, going into the great financial crisis, the baby boomers were headed into their 60s. Now they're headed into their 70s. So some of them genuinely are going to want to retire. They're not going to say, oh, that's fine. I'll stay in the workforce another 10 years. No big deal. Yep. Anyway. Yep. No, you're right. I think you're right. This is, a, this is a big issue that people are not paying enough attention to. So uh, I'm, I'm curious, is we're completely shifting gears here, but it's your fault. This is the way you the, the way <laughs> You're you up the order. Fine. That's all right. Keep going. Uh, even though we'll probably end with 11 because I just want to only talk about third parties these days. Anyways, um, can we rebuild the virtual security? That's that, I mean, I, I've never heard anybody suggest this literally. Yeah, and I'm, maybe I'm just not paying attention, but I I feel like the pendulum has already swung so far that Big Brother is with us dot 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 forever. Yeah, so the concern here on this particularly particular matter, uh, Danielle, is the is sort of the international aspect of cyber risks, and so the hacking of the U.S. systems, some federal systems, Office of Personnel Management files, you know, critical infrastructure files, etc. These are really big and disturbing hacks. I mean, these are huge breakdowns that we need to be petrified of. And that's one thing. But some of the cybersecurity experts I've talked to both within the government and outside of the government have said that's not even the most disturbing part. The most disturbing part is we're not even aware if there's ongoing monitoring that could be going on on these systems indefinitely. And one of the only truest, purest ways to fix these systems is to burn them down and rebuild them, right? Because there may be effective Trojan horse type dynamics where inside our systems today, maybe they have records of the, you know, the, they're keeping it, there's ongoing monitoring and logic taking place on personnel matters, confidential matters, who's spies, what have you. Now that becomes an ongoing risk rather than, hey, we identified the risk, we closed the door. Yeah, it's not that clear the systems may be permanently compromised. I'm not suggesting I know that's the case. I'm not suggesting that is not the case. What I'm suggesting is it's a very real possibility and it will likely spur calls for a digital rebuild, right? Sort of a rebuilding of digital infrastructure. And that's Um, possible. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it just takes, like many things, it takes money. You'll have to rebuild a new system, get it, test it, et cetera, then slowly migrate over. It takes time. It takes money. But yes, it's doable. Between that and the moon, we've really, really <laughs> up education. Um, all right. So here we go. Uh, third party. Yeah. Bull moose. Yep. I mean, if, if I hate to use these words, but if it's not now, when would it ever be? Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I, I have to say, I have always been someone who prides himself on independent thinking um, and thinking for myself. Um, the logic of polarization that has so deeply embedded itself in American politics and there's a lot of reasons we can talk about why and how we got here. I would argue gerrymandering was part of the situation. I could argue there's a whole bunch of reasons where the primary became the biggest battle, not the actual general election, for causing people to go more left in left-leaning districts or more right in right-leaning districts, resulting in this massive polarization. But that process has created a 
totally empty middle ground and around the centrist logic, which I think makes it really ripe for a centrist, slightly progressive leaning, long-term focused, working in the national interest political party. Um, and I think there's a lot of appetite for it. I think there'd be a lot of people interested in, 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 in supporting that. And I think you could get a whole new revitalization of the talent that would come into politics, right? There are so many people I know, so many people I've talked to, really capable, accomplished individuals who we would want as Americans to be serving in office. And they would never consider it, given the dynamics of today. They say, well, if I ran as a Democrat, I have to go party line everything or I'm going to be outcast by them. Or if I ran as a Republican, I'd have to be party line. I can't do that. And so there's no middle place for me to think for myself. And I think there should be a party that allows the conscience of the individual to come into play. Mm -hmm. right? No, Imagine I mean, that. crazy. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, politically speaking, I mean, I, I think the two most powerful people in America are Joe Manchin and Steve King. I mean, the independent and the moderate Democrat. I mean, it's, it's amazing that one person can say one thing in an interview and move the stock market. Yeah. And yet yeah. that's yeah. what we, that, that's what, that's what this has come down to. Yeah. Um, By the way, you can also imagine all sorts of interesting coalitions where you could pull out the centrist instinct among existing existing individuals there that would jump from existing parties over and you'd get a huge support base formed around the country of reasonable people that just want to put this behind them kind of dynamic. So um, I, I think that's, I think there's a real possibility of a third party emerging and have real success in the next five years. Yay. Hopefully they'll <laughs> be calling you and not me because there's that mindset. Um, <laughs> yep. There you go. So Every once in a while, if I need amusement, I will unmute my bubble vision so that I can hear the latest commercial real estate person say that urbanization is going to come back and come back strong and come back quick. Uh, I, mean, look, I mean, if you think about zero interest rate policy, and this isn't even just a United States phenomenon, it's global. I mean, what do you do in a zero interest rate environment? You build, you build up. So we have these massive multifamily high rises. We have more offices. We have more luxury hotels. Yeah. And yet... You know, again, I turn off the mute on Bubble Vision to hear them say it's all going to come back and stronger. You would yep. dispute that. I would. You know, so my view on this here is that COVID was an accelerant. Uh, this was fuel on existing fires, so to say. And what I mean by that is we had, pardon the medical pun, many pre existing conditions. And one of the pre existing conditions we had was a greater utilization of existing. Uh, existing capacities, right? So it was, okay, you have a home, but you know what? You maybe are traveling. And so why not monetize the empty home rather than let people go to a hotel? And so we got Airbnb, uh, sharing economy, or you know what? You got this office space, but you know what, Danielle, you travel all the time. Hey, you know what? I'm coming to Dallas for a day. I need an office. You might not even use your office. Fine. Vikram, pay me 50 bucks, leave it on the counter. It'll be good to go. I'll pay the cleaning. Fine. Great. So you get co-working or, you know, hey, we got all these cars out there and you get Uber or Lyft or what have you. And so what I think you've seen is that co-working specifically was getting a real tailwind. And now the work from home phenomenon is taking that a pre-existing condition and accelerating it. And so, you know, I've talked to many Fortune 500 uh, CEOs and their boards, one really large company has 30 million square feet of space around the world, has said they're going to reduce their real estate footprint by 25% in the next five years. This is a Fortune 500 company. This is a multi tens and tens of billions of dollars and thousands of employees and across hundreds of countries kind of thing. They're going to reduce their real estate footprint by 25%. Because they found that, hey, you can actually work remotely. Hey, we don't need everyone to go into the headquarters every day. We can have three days, one day of overlap. We can have surge capacity for the days where we have, but we don't need this much space. And you're right, because of the overbuilding, that's the supply side. Take the demand side, take the demand side down. The supply side's gone up. And what do you got? You got a recipe for some real headwinds when it comes to real estate. At least in the in the office real estate specifically. I mean, there may be other dynamics at work in other. Well, sectors. I always when when I speak of office, urban, I always speak of 
urban multifamily in the same sentence because one was built to support, you know, to support the other. Anyways, um, so uh, you think that there might be a solution, a different kind of a solution to our carbon footprint, to yep. climate change. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So this is, a, this is a great one. Thank you for bringing it up, Daniel. Look, I, I spent a lot of time with venture capitalists also, and I spent a lot of time with Silicon Valley startup types. And some of the more thoughtful individuals I know, the real pioneering, innovative types, uh, I interacted with some of them uh, back in grad school, say, what's the problem? We've got solutions. That's what we do. We as a technology community design solutions. So what's your problem? And you say, well, climate change is the problem. They say, fine. There's an engineering solution here too. What's the problem? Too much carbon? Great. Let's design something, synthetic biology or other mechanisms to deal with that. Or let's, there's a whole field known as geoengineering, which is starting to get more momentum, which is, hey, we can actually control some of these climate change impacts. So if it's too much carbon, maybe there, I mean, there's wacky ideas, vacuum cleaners that suck up carbon only and push it into outer space. There's synthetic biology that will chew up the carbon uh, in the environment and produce proteins that can be used for, for feed. So you don't have to have the whole agricultural uh, carbon footprint uh, that goes into producing protein. Uh, there's so many different dynamics at work here. Uh, it's a really, I, like to believe optimistic <laughs> uh, prediction that, hey, you know what? Technology can have an impact here too. Um, and what we view as an existential risk might just require a little more creativity and a little more brain power applied in a positive way uh, towards this end. And that could move the needle uh, and actually help us. So this is something we've touched on a little bit and we were talking about it in a different way. I was saying soybeans and and semiconductors and the, the, the deficiencies between China and the United yep. States and that inherent symbiosis. Uh, so where do you see this leading? Yeah. And if there's a solution for everything, theoretically, since you're in the engineering school, uh, <laughs> why can't China just, I mean, this is this actually is not part of your prediction, but why couldn't China just eventually solve all of its problems? Yeah. So what I think you're hinting at here is my belief that the US-China decoupling, the mm -hmm. sort of great power rivalry, uh, and my analysis produces deficiencies on one end and you know deficiencies on the other side. And so this bifurcation breaks up what was a functioning uh, system that, that spread the goods to where they were needed and uh, et cetera. And what we find when we when I do the spreadsheet, there are some very obvious deficiencies that exist on the Chinese side and very obvious deficiencies that exist on the Western or American led side of that ledger. Um, the Chinese, as you've indicated, have a very big deficiency when it comes to arable land, productive agriculture, and sort of the needs to fulfill the, the sort of dietary desires of a really large and rapidly growing middle class with more consuming power, right? Like that's just what we know that. Um, on the flip side, you know, you hinted at some large percentage of goods that we have coming, whether it's auto parts or what have you from China. I mean, 97, I think it's 97% of antibiotics are sourced from China that are consumed in the United States. 90 plus percent of vitamin C. I mean, we have major vulnerabilities. We know the rare earth vulnerabilities that we've talked about, that processing capacity and capability, et cetera. Those are things that can be built domestically here in the United States or in the Western ecosystem. Uh, it just takes time. So I think that is what's going on right now is that we're seeing those vulnerabilities get addressed as best they can. You know, I guarantee you that we are thinking about our access to pharmaceutical ingredients differently post this pandemic than we did before the pandemic, where pre-pandemic, it was lowest cost, just in time. Now we're thinking, uh-oh, just in case resilience. Right. Uh, and so that's coming forth. But I do think rare earths and pharma are two that we can imagine a lot of effort and focus on. Um, but on the Chinese side, you can imagine the, the sort of uh, the food specifically, and there's other vulnerabilities there as well. Um, you know, they don't have any jet engine capabilities. I mean, there's other things, but they will get there. And, you know, so to, to answer your question, can China eventually solve all these things? 
is really a question about human ingenuity. I mean, if the Chinese are going to solve their things, I think we're going to solve our things and, you know, we'll have two ecosystems. <laughs> uh, it's really about the friction between here and there. Um, so uh, technology, let, let's stay there for, for just, yep. just a bit. Um, my daughter can take a picture of herself and transform it into all kinds of things. Look, mom, look what I look like. I'm like, whoa, how'd you do that? It's very simple. Just do this, 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 and this. Yep. Um, this has kind of gone mainstream and it's become very broad. And in a world in which we now know that wide swaths of people can be brainwashed, yeah. uh, the, the ability to authenticate, to make yeah. anybody a public figure look like they've been anywhere doing anything with technology could theoretically become a political cesspool where you actually have disruption. I mean, we've look, we don't even have to speak in theory anymore. We can, we can speak because it's in the rearview mirror. We've seen it. Yep. So what, what where, where, where does this go? Yeah. So on this side of technology and the, and the use of deep fake technologies, mm -hmm. um, I think this is really problematic and is going to require uh, so, some rapid response and resilience focused regulation. Uh, and what do I mean by that? I mean, I think this is a genie that's unfortunately already out of the bottle. I, this genie's been let out. Now what we need to do is have a rapid monitoring and, and, and sort of regulatory regime to authenticate so people can think for themselves and say, wait, hold on a sec. Did that person really say that? That person really say that I don't, I know it looks like them. I know it appears that they're authentic. I know it's definitely the face. Everything looks, my brain is telling me it is that person saying this thing, but intellectually I'm having trouble with what they're saying with what I know they would say. And do I blindly believe that? Or do I then authenticate? Or is there some seal that's been put on that says authentic or, or is there some way to check it? so that we can evaluate. So this is a really problematic area that I think is, is gonna require some, some, some serious thinking, but deep fake technologies that enable videos that look authentic to convey messages that may be not authentic are gonna be a basic tool of international disinformation campaigns. I think this, and in fact, it may already be, right? Being utilized more than we realize. Um, and so I, I think this is worth watching. Unfortunately, I don't have a, an optimistic answer or solution just yet. <laughs> Hopeful that people will come up with one. But uh, right now, it's, it's, it's one of these you have to watch topics. Um, so we're going to go way north here. And it's not every day that Canada and tensions are in the same sentence. You just can't picture it. <laughs> and yet, and yet, there is an 1,800-kilometer underwater mountain ridge that runs from Siberia towards Greenland? Yeah, yeah. Oh, where do you find this stuff? <laughs> so I have, I've been paying attention, uh, Danielle, and I've actually written this up over multiple predictions in prior years, that the Arctic could emerge as a flashpoint geopolitically. So the Arctic is one of my regions that I pay attention to because others aren't, honestly. That's why. That's where I believe truth begins on the fringes. And so I, I read the fringes. Um, and, you know, today's fringe turns into tomorrow's truth. And I've been paying attention to the geopolitical dynamics of the Arctic because of global warming, the Northern Passage, the possibility of fuels and hydrocarbons being up there, the Russians planting a flag on the seabed of the North Pole and claiming it as their land with a robot, et cetera. Um, and so anyway, there is a territorial dispute because of how the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea works over this underwater mountain ridge, which is really long, and Canada claims it's theirs, Greenland slash Denmark claims it's theirs, and the Russians claim it's theirs. And it actually has huge geopolitical implications as to who gets, quote unquote, sovereignty over this. Um, and, and anyway, I think it's got the potential to turn into a flashpoint. Combine that with the fact that the United States has been doing joint military exercises with uh, a NATO partner in Norway, uh, in the far Arctic, uh, or in the northern part of uh, Norway, that it happens to be also where the Russian fleet is pointed. Um, and so I think this is sort of, again, creating some tensions that, um, you know, on a, on a three to five year type view might in fact find their way to the surface. 
bizarrely enough, the Arctic takes us to uh, the last subject for the day and the one that, that, that hoovers up more of my Twitter feed than any other subject. And I, I say the Arctic brings us to the subject because when you think about, when you think about superpower status, uh, he who rules the seas, yep. you've, heard that, you've heard that phrase before, most people think that it is impossible in the near term for the United States to lose its global reserve currency status. Yeah. And a lot of people uh, think that Bitcoin can naturally rise up and somehow displace the reserve currency. You only have to dismiss 500 years of history in order for that to happen. Because at last check, countries prefer to have that status as a way of dominating the global economy. So what do you, how do you envision the evolution or the loss of yeah. the dollar as a reserve currency status? This is going to end up being the last, the last part of our discussion. Sure. Well, we could talk about this forever. I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, I think the US dollar a reserve currency status exists until it doesn't. It's, it sounds like a trite way to describe it, but it works right now because there really aren't any alternatives. There's no viable alternative. You thought maybe the Euro could rise to the ranks of that, but they fell apart. They can't get their act together. The United States of Europe is not congealing. In fact, it's disintegrating. And so I don't think that's got a really bright future as a contender for a global reserve currency. Um, well, do you go over to the yen? Not really. A declining demographic profile, you know, waning uh, economic influence, doesn't really have a military. Okay. Um, the Chinese yuan? Well, I don't really quite get the belief that people have that authoritarian regimes that have potentially nationalistic instincts, uh, that I'm going to put my assets there with the belief that rule of law that they claim exists, may not exist, could exist, don't know if it exists, but I really need it to exist <laughs> to put my money there. So there's no alternative. There really isn't. But with that said, the incentive structures are stronger than they've ever been for other countries that are jealous of the quote unquote exorbitant privilege that we have to be able to print, to be able to have effectively unlimited demand for what we offer the world. Uh, and, and they're kind of jealous and kind of angry about that. And I think they're going to work on trying to find an alternative to the dollar. Uh, and by the way, we've weaponized it. We've, we've fully weaponized the dollar. Well, bingo. I was going to say the weaponization of the dollar has also contributed to that incentive structure, right? Uh, you know, using SWIFT and all these systems to sort of, uh, you know, attack and contain and control uh, some of the rogue or political competitors, I guess is the right word, um, has the potential to really backfire in the form of incentivizing uh, the emergence of an alternative. Now, I think it'll be really hard for an alternative to emerge. I really do. Uh, I don't think this is a trivial undertaking. It, if it does, lines up with an earlier statement, I think it'll probably need to be some form of hard currency backed by something because people will have doubt. Um, and you know, for years, they'll test whether or not that real backing is in fact real. So, okay, you're going to give me X ounces of gold if I bring you a, a whatever. Um, call the currency wherever you want. Uh, and people will test it. Like, okay, here, where's the gold? Give me this. Or a precious metal or platinum or whatever it is. Just give it to me. I want to see it. And they're going to test it for years before they give it any real faith. Um, and they'll test it with small dollars and it'll take time. So we'll see the alternatives emerge before they actually emerge. Uh, but don't fool ourselves. We shouldn't fool ourselves. I mean, the, the, the endeavor to produce an alternative uh, is as strong as ever. And like COVID, you could see inflation as being the accelerant, so to speak. Could be. That's right. Definitely. Um, okay. So I, I, we've just got a few seconds left. So I, I, yeah. I, I have to ask you, uh, Harvard, Yale, next time they meet on the pitch, <laughs> who, do you, who do you root for? I mean, I've got to know. Yeah. So I generally always sit with my undergraduate affiliation, which is, uh, there you yeah. go. always stay with you. There you go. That's yeah, right. My, my, my father was born and raised in East Haven. I spent a lot of time up in that part of the world. So I'm right there with you. Go Yale. Perfect. Great.
Well, look, uh, we didn't get finished with our discussion. And the only thing that that means is that we can come in, come together again. Happy to come back. <laughs> Looking forward to it myself. Thank you so much for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Danielle. Enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. If you were as fascinated as I was with the diversity of knowledge that Vikram has, I mean, truly amazing. Uh, I want for you to do yourself a favor. Go back and listen to the discussion that I had with Leland Miller. Vikram and I spoke a lot about China, and China is not, is not a subject that is going to go away. It's going to become much bigger, a much more prominent focus in the coming years. So go back, listen to the interview that I had with Leland, and if you've not yet subscribed to Valuetainment Economics, go ahead, click on that subscribe button below, and I will see you next time for the next episode of Down the Middle. Thank you so much.